Tonight's a sala puja. Puja means paying homage. A sala is the name of the month, June, July. Of course, we're not paying homage to the month. We're paying homage to events that happened in this month on the full moon. After the Buddha came to awakening. He continued experiencing the bliss of release for seven weeks. Then at the beginning of the eighth week, which would have been about a week ago, if this were that year, he decided to teach. First he thought of his two teachers who had taught him before he had gone off on his path of austerities. He realized that they had passed away and gone into the form formless realms where they couldn't be contacted. So that was their loss. Then he thought of the five brethren who had attended to him during his austerities and then had left him when he had stopped the austerities. He realized that they were in Benares, and so he decided to go there. He walked for a week. When they saw him coming, they said, oh, here comes that, the lazy, lazy Gotama. And they had a pact that they wouldn't attend to him as they had in the past, but they couldn't help themselves. As he approached, they took his bowl, prepared a seat, but they addressed him as Auso, friend. He said, this is not appropriate. I've gained awakening. He said, how can you have gained awakening? You've left the path of austerities. And so he gave the talk that we chanted just now. It started out with how the path of austerities was an extreme that was to be avoided, just as sensuality was an extreme to be avoided. Instead, he taught the middle way. This was his first teaching. There are two striking images in the, in the teaching. One is the name of the teaching, which is setting the Dharma wheel in motion. The other is the, the image of the middle way. This is a middle way between the extremes of self-torture or being devoted to sensual pleasures. But it's not a middling way. In other words, we don't go halfway. Think of a John Cha's image. Self-torture or pain is like the, the head of a snake. Sensual pleasures are like the tail of the snake. We see that the head has teeth, so we know we shouldn't catch it there. But then we think it's okay to touch the other end because it doesn't have any teeth. But of course they're connected. Now, if we were to take a middling way, it would be like picking up the snake by the middle, which would, wouldn't help anything at all. And what it's talking about a middle way is talking about getting off the continuum. Because we go back and forth, back and forth between sensual pleasure and pain. Then to avoid the pain, we don't see any other alternative, so we go back for the sensual pleasure. And the purpose of the path is to get us out of that back and forth. It's very similar to that hell that's described in one of the suttas, a big iron box with flames coming out of each side of the box and reaching over to the other side, and the hell beings are in there running around, their flesh being burned away and then being replenished so it can burn away again. And every now and then a door opens in one of the walls. You take that as the prospect for sensual pleasure, and so they go running to the door. And just as they get there, it slams shut. Then another door opens on another side, so they go running over there. And just as they get there, it slams shut. This goes on for a long time. Finally, they get to a door that doesn't slam shut, but then they fall into the hell of excrement. That's symbolic of the way people tend to run after sensual pleasures because they think that it's the only escape from pain. And all too often, either they don't get the pleasure or the, the pleasure is going to entail pain. So we need to get out of that back and forth. 
That's what the middle way does. It finds a way that transcends that back and forth. Precisely in the factor of right concentration. That was the factor that the Buddha discovered first of all the factors in the path. You know the story when he was performing his austerities. He realized that the path of austerities finally after six years was not leading anywhere. He could just die. And that gained the awakening he wanted. He asked himself, is there another path? He remembered a time when he was young. He'd entered the first jhana spontaneously. And so he asked himself, could this be the path? And something inside him said yes. But then he realized that he'd been starving himself. He didn't have the strength to get the mind in a good, strong concentration. That's why he left his austerities. So the key to the path, and as the Buddha sometimes says, the heart of the path, is right concentration, because it provides an alternative. It's neither sensual pleasure nor pain. It's a pleasure that's non-sensual, the pleasure of form. And this is special because it's unlike sensual pleasures. It doesn't intoxicate the mind. It doesn't have to involve any unskillful attitudes. It's part of the way out. The other seven factors of the path are then its requisites or its supports. And the Sutta of the Buddha actually talks about only one of the other factors, which is right view. It defines in terms of the Four Noble Truths. The first truth is the truth of suffering. It's not that life is suffering or that there is suffering. Suffering is clinging. Now that points inside. Now, as the five brethren are listening to this, they realize they were going to have to look inside themselves. Where is their clinging? What kind of clinging? Why do they cling? And that was the second truth. Three kinds of craving. Craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, craving for not becoming. These are the things that cause us to cling in ways that create suffering. Now the structure of the path is that when he says that it is possible to put an end to that clinging and an end to that by putting an end to the craving. And you do it by the Eightfold Path, by the middle way. It's like a doctor's analysis of a disease. He describes the symptoms. This is well, where are the symptoms coming from. And then you attack the symptoms, not straight at the symptoms, but you attack them at the cause. And you say it is possible to cure them. And here's the cure. So that's the middle way. As for the Dharma wheel, back in the time of the Buddha, in philosophical texts and legal texts, when you had to list different variables against one another to work out all the permutations to make what we would call a table, they would call a wheel. Because remember, this is an oral literature, and you have to go through one by one by one each of the permutations. And one of the images that would be useful to hold in mind would be how many spokes does this wheel have? And then just go through each spoke around the, the center. In this case is where the Buddha talks about the Four Noble Truths again, but this time he talks about the duties appropriate to each. And the fact that he'd completed those duties. That gives three types of knowledge for each truth. The knowledge of the truth itself, the knowledge of the duty, and the knowledge that it's done. Four noble truths, three knowledges. Three times four is twelve. Those are the twelve permutations that we chanted. Now our Dharma wheel here at the moment in the Sala has twelve spokes. But back in ancient India, the really old, old depictions of the Dharma wheel have many, many spokes. And apparently that's because they kept in mind the fact that the wheel was set in motion. So you see all the spokes whirring around. Now when you set a wheel in motion, it's a sign of exerting power. And the wheel travels. 
In this case, the first person it traveled to was Anyagundanya, one of the five brethren. He was the one who attained the Dharma eye. Whatever subject origination is all subject to cessation. That sometimes it sounds it's simply a conclusion that everything changes. But you have to ask yourself, what state of mind would that realization occur to in a way that would be really valid? valid? It would be if you'd seen something that wasn't originated and didn't pass away. You know the passages where they say that someone who's seen the Dharma has seen the deathless. And it was at that point that the Triple Gem became complete. As I mentioned this morning, we think of Visakha Bhujha as in homage to the Buddha, Magha Bhujha in homage to the Sangha. The Salam Bhujha, some people say, is in homage to the Dharma, but it's actually a homage to all three because this was the point where all three became complete. The Dharma as a teaching was finally established in the world. And in doing so, the first member of the Noble Sangha arose. And when there was the first member of the Noble Sangha, that meant the Buddha was not just a private Buddha, he was a complete Buddha. So these are our refuges. So tonight we're paying homage to the, the act that made all those refugees complete. Now they're complete outside. It's up to us to bring them inside, to make them complete in our hearts. And that's what the Dharma Wheel is for, to remind us. This is the teaching to keep in mind at all times as we practice. Everything else that the Buddha taught has to be fit into the context of the Four Noble Truths and the duties that are appropriate to them. For example, sometimes people say that the Buddha's basic teaching was on not-self, and they interpret that as a no-self teaching. But you remember that Buddha's whole purpose in teaching was to help people put an end to suffering. And how does believing that there is no self, or coming to the conclusion that there is no self, how does that end suffering? It can be an excuse for all kinds of laziness. And it can actually get in the way of the path when you say, well, there's nobody to suffer. So there's nobody doing anything, so why bother? But if you look at the teaching in terms of the Four Noble Truths, you see it as a not-self-strategy. One of the duties is to develop dispassion for the craving, develop dispassion for the clinging, and you do that by seeing how these things are inconstant and stressful and not self, not worthy of claiming as claiming as yours, not worthy holding on worth holding on to. In that case, the Four Noble Truths and the teaching on that self fit together. In fact, the teaching on that self works because that third noble truth says when you let go of all this clinging, then there'll be true happiness. That's why we would take on the teaching of not self to begin with. So you want to bring the Dharma into your heart. Remember, it's the Four Noble Truths. Whatever comes up in the mind, ask yourself, which truth does this belong to? And once you know which truth it is, then you know the proper duty. And you look at all the different teachings that the Buddha laid out in the course of his 45 years of teaching. And you want to know how to apply them, when to apply them. Well, Take the Four Noble Truths and their duties as your guide. That way the Dharma Wheel comes into you, it exerts its power in you. But it's not an oppressive power, it's a liberating power. The Buddha never forced his teachings on anyone. They're there for anyone who wants to put it into suffering. They're a refuge available to anyone. It's a question, if you respect the Buddha, and if you ask him, why do you respect the Buddha? Well, he has you respect something that's worthwhile in yourself, which is your desire for true happiness. 
He's saying, take that seriously. All too many people in the world will tell you that true happiness is impossible. Go for the quick fix. Grab what you can while you can. But as, as the Buddha said, that's just a recipe for more and more suffering. There is a true happiness that is available. So the purpose of having days like this is to reflect on what's really important in the teaching. and to rededicate ourselves. You see the compassion that the Buddha had for the five brethren. It didn't stop there. It just continued on and on and on for 45 years. And it extends now to, to today. As long as we still keep these teachings in mind and still put them into practice, they're still alive. Because the Dharma that was established on that night is what's called Sasana Dharma the Dharma, the teaching. It's not always available in the world. Sapawa Dhamma, the, the Dhamma of truths or things in and of themselves, that's always true. But it's only when the Dharma has been formulated that people can take those truths and use them to put, it, to put an end to the suffering that they've been causing themselves for who knows how long. It took all that work that, that the Buddha did over his many, many lifetimes to become a Buddha, to bring this Dharma back into the world. And he goes, to teach people out of compassion, the first thing they do is they, they treat them with disrespect. So make sure that that's not your attitude, that you treat the teachings with the respect that they, they deserve, because there's no, no other teaching in the world that's nearly as precious as this, that's nearly as useful as this. It takes a lot to bring it into the world, so take advantage of it while it's here. <laughs>